English easy. All right, third time shooting this, this stupid disclaimer. So when I uploaded my video, the original one, to YouTube, it turns out that because I used Tom Scott's video within my video and the audio of it played, I get a copyright ID notification on that, and so I can't monetize my own video. So if you see random jump cuts in my video, that's mainly the reason. If you want to see the actual full video, uh, Tom Scott's video, it's in the, video, in the link down below. I'm not going to be uploading the full video, unfortunately, because I can't monetize it. Sorry. Hi, so what I thought would be interesting would be to look at popular videos on the internet, this one from Tom Scott, about theoretical computer science and whether it's accurate or whether it's just to make people aware of theoretical computer science but not talk about any of the details. So let's get started. I haven't seen these videos before. I just want to give you my initial reaction and some thoughts about the video and some of the contents that they have. And so apparently this is about problems that the computers can't solve, so probably about the halting problem, so let's see. And I'll periodically stop it in the middle as we go along and I'll offer a commentary. So he said infinite time there, so... <laughs> It, well, in, if you have infinite time, then you can actually solve any problem whatsoever. The problem is that we typically don't work with decidability in terms of an infinite amount of time. Most of what he said was correct, but it's just that you need a finite amount of time versus an infinite amount of time. Probably just an, a, an emotional, for lack of a better word, uh, choice of words there. So he's probably going to do a proof of the halting problem and probably do the standard technique of assuming that there's a decider and then trying to get some kind of logical contradiction. So let's see what happens. Yeah, so he's probably going to be talking about infinite loops and like being able to detect an infinite loop in an arbitrary program being an undecidable problem, which is essentially the halting problem. I wish I can be that good at actually doing graphics for my videos. <laughs> but yeah, um, if you've ever been in intro programming class, and I've taught it many times, um, you will find that there are infinite programs, programs that run for an infinite amount of time that are just written accidentally. It's a common thing for people who haven't programmed before. Um, if you use like Python for loops, for example, then this is very, very hard to do. It's mainly with while loops because it's mainly about the condition versus just iterating over a collection. That's not the point of this video though. So I actually have a nice example that I use when I teach this type of thing to motivate why this is important. So I had a program for my research that I had running for six consecutive weeks. And I asked the students, can you actually determine by looking at this program running in front of you, this singular program, whether it will stop or not? And the answer is yes, you can determine that. It's not that you know the answer, but it is determinable whether or not the program will stop. It either will stop or it will not stop. In, in that case, it happened to not stop, but that's not the point. The thing that he's probably uh, going to talk about here is uh, about singular programs versus answering the question about a general program across all possible programs. So let's see. <laughs> yeah, uh, a lot of foreign words come up in this uh, area sometimes, and it's just, <laughs> you either have to avoid them or just try to weasel your way through <laughs> pronouncing them. Yep, absolutely true. So Turing wasn't the only person uh, who actually proved that the halting problem is undecidable. Um, Alonzo Church used the lambda calculus um, as an equivalent model of computation and later Turing's machine and um, the lambda calculus were shown to be equivalent to each other. There are these other things called rewriting systems that are also um, equivalent to these models. There are, it's just basically different approaches. Alan Turing wasn't the only person, but there were, uh, were a few people uh, working at the same time. Actually, there were, the story of Alan Turing is obviously well um, well known and is actually very interesting in and of itself. There's like a whole bunch of things that happened in rapid succession between Alonzo Church and Alan Turing and other people right around this time as uh, Turing pr uh, published his paper. So it's actually a very, very interesting read. I recommend 
uh, checking out the Wikipedia page for these mathematicians. It's, uh, it's unbelievable what's happened in the 30s. So actually to expand upon that, um, these humans uh, had actually a stack of papers. And what you did was you, the, the person who was a computer, the occupation computer, would look at the thing on the piece of paper in front of them, make some kind of calculation, and then put it onto the stack of the papers or take one off of the stack, which is actually what the motivation for Turing machines actually was because it allows you to move left and right, which correspond to taking a thing off the stack and adding thing to a stack. So it, it, the motivation was clearly uh, there. Okay, so it looks like he's going to be using an, uh, a two-way infinite tape. The standard model is a, is a one-way infinite tape that starts at one place and goes infinitely in another direction. It's not actually infinitely long for the purposes of computation because you can't actually write down the configuration of a Turing machine if it's infinitely long. What you do is you maintain the last position that has ever been visited or up to where the input uh, actually is in, in case you haven't ran that very long so that it's in at any point if you want to add a cell by moving right then you are allowed to do so but it the tape itself is infinitely long but for the purposes of computation it's only finitely long after a finite number of steps because you can only move right one cell at a time so it, it's this is a little bit um, misleading that it actually is infinitely long for the purposes of computation, but technically it is infinitely long, but for the purposes of computation, it actually isn't infinitely long, or we shouldn't actually think of it that way because we can't access arbitrarily far cells um, in one step. If you want to know the actual details of it, check my videos about Turing machines. <laughs> but uh, for those who, um, who haven't seen that, so the instructions there are basically just um, transitions between the various states. So the state register there um, is maintaining which state you're in. There's a finite set of states and the instructions say if you're in a particular state right now and you're reading something off of the tape right now, then you will uh, apply some uh, operation, which is to write a particular value, as he said, to that particular cell and move one direction, either move right one cell or move left one cell, um, and then change state. So then the state register is updated. But there are some uh, other things about the there being a singular accept state and a singular reject state because we're destroying the input as we are moving along. We're always writing into a cell. So then we will um, we need to have a state where we explicitly stop, we, uh, which are the accept and reject states. So that's probably what he's referring to. Um, but there, uh, other than that, there really isn't a whole lot behind the scenes. So the notion of loop there is kind of wishy-washy. That's probably skipping over details because there are three behaviors of a Turing machine on any input. And it, it can either stop, which goes to the accept or the reject state, or it can loop, and the loop means that it has some configuration on the tape and it's in a particular looking at some cell and looking at the, in, in some particular state, then at some point later, it ends in the same configuration, the same tape contents, the same placement of the tape head in the same state. So that's a loop, but a Turing machine can also diverge. So, if we know that the machine actually will uh, produce a loop or uh, never diverges, which I'm gonna to get to in a second, so it can either halt or loop, then we can actually solve the halting problem. Because what we can do is maintain the set of configurations that we've seen so far. And if we've ever seen one before, then we're gonna always repeat that because the machine is deterministic. So the important point is that the Turing machine can diverge, which means that it never repeats a configuration, but never halts at the same time. In other words, it always is gonna allocate new cells, but it never is gonna repeat a configuration before. So that, that's, that's what can happen. And that's what's known as the Church-Turing thesis, and that's 
uh, something I've covered on the channel before, but it's basically any algorithm can be converted into a Turing machine and vice versa. There's a whole, a whole thing that's glossed over here about universal Turing machines, but I'm not gonna go into that. So there's a small thing here. This is mostly right. The only thing is that most um, forms of the halting problem are phrased about a given uh, a Turing machine and an input string. So it's a pair of a machine and a string, whereas here he's saying that it's a given program, but it's more or less the same. You could actually just focus on the Turing machine running on the empty input, in which case there's no actual input given, it's just the Turing machine. But um, it's um, for purposes of decidability, it's exactly the same, but the it, it's not exactly the same. And so this is a classic technique of proof, which is called proof by contradiction. You assume something that you eventually show to be false, and then you get some kind of logical contradiction. So assuming that this halts machine actually works, then we're gonna get a machine that can't work. And so therefore the halts machine couldn't have worked. <laughs> I like the little animation of it like <laughs> bobbing up and down. I think that's pretty cool. So this is a, a classic way of proving the halting problem, which is that this machine, the, the pair of machines here, the, the thing that's encompassing this whole thing has to take a Turing machine in and it's essentially doing the opposite. The machine that we're making is doing the opposite of what the input machine is. So then that means, uh, okay, I'll just let him explain, but I, I know where he's going with this. Yeah, so that's the trick. I, I like the little animation of like actually converting it into code and then feeding it in. Um, I'll, I'll let him explain. <laughs> Vanishes in a proof of law. Um, so the, the reason why you can actually do that and he may say this, but I might as well say it. <laughs> uh, yeah, so the reason why you can do this is that the opposite machine is guaranteed to work on all Turing machines and do its function, whatever it is. So it's guaranteed to work. So that means that the opposite machine should be able to take any Turing machine whatsoever and do the correct thing. Opposite itself is a Turing machine. So it must answer correctly on itself too, because it's, it's just a normal Turing machine. So this opposite machine might actually get the answer correct for every Turing machine, except this one. So it, it actually might get it wrong for other ones too, but here it has to get it wrong for this Turing machine, which means that at least one input is wrong, which means that it couldn't have gotten the answer correctly on everything. So that's why, uh, we're going to get the contradiction. I like his actual description there of saying any program being presented as input, because if you have a given, uh, so oh, that's actually not the right word. So if you have a fixed program that um, is not part of any input, then it's decidable of whether it halts. It might not be figure outable, <laughs> but it can, it, it is possible to at least figure out. It, it's not, May, it might not be figure outable by humans in the foreseeable future, but the answer is determined. It's not something that is impossible to do by any algorithm whatsoever. All right, so <laughs> there, there's a slight mishap right there. So infinite power, and he said time earlier, what he actually means is unbounded. So unbounded means there's no actual limit to how much power you have or time or whatever. It, you always have a finite amount, but you can always allocate more as you need it. So that's what he actually means, unbounded, and but not actually infinite. Actually, the Turing machine that we were saying before, it's unbounded when it diverges of how far it actually goes. It's not actually infinite, it's unbounded. Good, good. I absolutely uh, admire uh, his dedication to that. That's good. So... That's, this was a fantastic video. There were very minor nitpicks all the way through, but on the whole, it's a very good introduction to uh, theoretical computer science and computability theory. So I would give this, let's say an A minus. It's very, very good. There are just some small things that need to be fixed. All right, so hopefully that was interesting and gave you some additional insight on theoretical computer science. Put comments down below if you have any questions about Tom Scott's video or my reaction or theoretical computer science. 
As always, please like the video and subscribe to the channel. It really helps us out. There are many links in the video description if you want to support the channel further. And as always, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time. That was easy. That was easy. That was easy.